I mean, there is the overwhelming thing which uh, everybody uh, knew, though, that if it's statistically significant, that doesn't tell you that it's biologically significant. You know, statistically significant is just a mathematical manipulation. You have to know the subject to uh, uh, to decide. Uh, the if red meat consumption and uh, the risk of type two diabetes have a statistically significant association, that doesn't mean anything. You got to show that that, uh, that 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 there's some real data there. Uh, and you and you got to give an explanation. Where where does red meat tie into uh, 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 diabetes? Uh, on the face of it, uh, you don't have to be in uh, biology for more than uh, a couple of weeks to realize that uh, that kind of association would never be found. Well, how have you been? Good to see you. I've uh, been pretty good, all things considered. Uh, yeah, that's true. There's a lot of that going around, all things considered. It's been a bit of a crazy couple okay. of years for everybody. I, I got good instructions on uh, 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 where to position myself. I'm going to give you some really good advice. Okay. <laughs> if, if you move to the left or the right, it will not look like that ceiling fan is on your head. I can do that. How's that? I would do that. Uh, do perfect. That right. yeah. yeah. There we go. Yeah, I'm a, we're actually in a process of, of upgrading. I'm going to put a little studio in my house. We just moved, and so we'll have kind of a better filming atmosphere. That's going to happen over the next you know, couple right. months, I yeah. think. But uh, well, I, I myself anyway. always get a photograph taken with a tree growing out of my head, so I'm a, a little. <laughs> Well, anyway, I, I think we, you know, like I said, I, I think we're we're more interested in the content than the than the, than the optics, I suppose. But uh, anyway, uh, just for the folks that aren't familiar with you, Dr. Feynman, could you just briefly, you know, in, in, a, in a couple minutes, just tell us, you know, your 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 background? Yeah, I'm a, uh, a professor of cell biology at in Brooklyn at uh, SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University, and. Uh, I've had a number of different interests in uh, science. I'm originally trained as an enzyme chemist, but I've been doing nutrition for a while. My current interests are in cancer, and uh, I'm working with uh, uh, particularly Matthew Pincus and uh, uh, Eugene Fine, and we have some novel methods of detecting cancer. And I'm also interested in whether we can treat cancer with ketogenic diets. And it turns out that I'm uh, interested in uh, the basic philosophy of science, because what's happened in, in nutrition, as you undoubtedly know, is, is that uh, there's a real crisis in, in the um, methods that are being used the style and uh, in some sense really the ethics of uh, research and nutrition. So I uh, want to address those things. And uh, I learned uh, I learned about science from my father. My father was a physician and he taught me early on about uh, atoms and molecules. but he was a uh, noble fellow and he uh, I think I had the idea from him. Well, I learned from him that uh, science was uh, uh, more than cyclotrons. It was basic honesty and facing uh, real questions. And uh, I, of course, grew up with the idea that uh, science and medicine were uh, uh, the same idea. And that's, of course, not true. There's a big overlap, but uh, they are uh, different. And that's uh, something that, uh, you know, we have to take account of. So um, uh, that's where I am now. And uh, I, uh, I want to, I mean, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Fumman. And I, I want to, you know, talk about that a little bit. I certainly want to, I mean, let's talk about cancer, because I think that's something that, that is a very important topic. But 
you know, when you say that the ethics of science are problematic, I mean, there's, in many cases, there's a lot of profit based upon what the science seems to show. And so there's, there seems, there seems to be almost a narrative or a uh, profit motive. And so, and, and reason why science might be, may or may not be done. Can you expand a little more upon what do you, what are the problems you see with the current way nutritional research in particular has been conducted over the years? I know there's a lot of heavy reliance on epidemiology, which I think is not particularly useful, but we continue to do that and fund those studies over and over and over again. They don't seem to teach us anything. What are your thoughts? Uh, 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 I have a, a couple of slides here. Can I show those? Uh, yeah, let me allow you to share the screen. Give me just a half second here. And so do you know how to share screens on here? I know how to share it on my end. I, I think you okay, have to go ahead. Be, you should be able to do that now. Uh, I think so this at is the bottom it. of the screen, there you go, there you go. You see oh, that? I can see it, yes, we, I think we can all see that. So yeah, I, I got to yeah. give you guys uh, credit for good timing. I uh, This just showed up on my uh, email, uh, just exactly what you were saying. Uh, nutritional epidemiology, abolition versus defending the status quo. And this this is uh, Peter Atiyah's uh, blog, and he uh, is talking about a paper uh, by David uh, Allison that just came out. And this uh, paper uh, basically says that uh, nutritional epidemiology is, uh, as you say, it's at least in crisis. Uh, and uh, the uh, tip off is that he um, says nutritional epidemiology can be improved through greater scientific rigor and adherence to scientific reporting commensurate with research methods used. Well, uh, those are just words. This article does not uh, mention uh, any names, it doesn't tell you really what the problem is, and uh, it's ducking the issue. And uh, that's really what we have. And um, uh, this is not the only uh, critique. Uh, I, I myself have been a critic of the uh, medical literature for a while. It, it, it has studies that very small sample sizes. Uh, people explore things, you know, ask, uh, ask things like, uh, does uh, red meat cause uh, diabetes? Why would you even think that? And there are conflicts of interest, as you say. I personally feel that um, you're kind of obligated to uh, uh, not, um, at my end, at the scientific an analysis, and you're obligated not to criticize the sponsor, no matter how much you suspect in the background the researcher is. Because if the researcher is trying to please the sponsor, uh, that's really serious problem. You know, you can interpret things as, uh, uh, in as dopey a way as you want, but you have to be honest in reporting the material and, and you have to assume that people are doing that unless you really have data. And uh, this is uh, the uh, ethical problem is that they are uh, fitting their uh, uh, data to uh, a preferred theory. And then the real problem it, well, there, there are two major problems as I see it. One is uh, a reliance on statistics and the wrong statistics. Uh, I, I, uh, the, one of the real benefits that offsets uh, having to deal with these bad studies is that you, sometimes you learn something. And to be honest, I've just learned about statistics in the past couple of months. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, you, you know, when you uh, work in uh, physical science or medical science, you have to know a little bit of statistics, but I don't uh, admit that I don't really understand it. It's, it's quite a bit different from science and uh, it's a special branch of mathematics, but I've learned a lot about it, interestingly, from uh, uh, YouTube. So that's one problem. The literature itself is, uh, that's, that's where the compromise is. 
that's where you can uh, uh, blame uh, the dollar motive. The uh, uh, literature has, uh, the, the publishing industry is severely hurting science and it's cashing in on the fact that you can uh, produce a journal online and it basically doesn't cost you anything. And then you can turn around, you can pretend that you're doing a, a favor to the uh, population by not charging subscriptions as a hard copy would, but you're charging the author sometimes outrageous amounts of money. And that uh, there there's money and, and there's science and they're close together and they shouldn't be. And that's different than when you're the scientist. As the scientist, you have to be granted the idea that you're uh, going to report the data. Uh, but when you're in the business of uh, producing journals, your obligation is to make money, and that's uh, pretty serious. So anyway, these, these are real criticisms. And like I say, I've been uh, a critic for some time, but uh, I would never write anything like this in print. You know, I, I put it in a blog or uh, this comes from the editor of Lancet. So if it's so bad, where was he when it was getting bad? So uh, uh, this is my, uh, <laughs> my uh, of the uh, of the system. What, you know, you said something in there that I found almost kind of disturbing that, you know, you, you learned about statistics and, and you're a lifelong academic researcher, you know, obviously a smart, smart person that's been this, in this field for, for many, many years. And you, you had to rely on YouTube to learn, learn statistics. Is that, a, is that a criticism of the academic uh, process in general as, as, you had, as you had to go outside of the, the usual? Uh, no, guess, no. The, the, uh, 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 that was just a actual uh, uh, a statement of what happened. YouTube is uh, very good. It has the guy who did the YouTube is a fantastic character. His name is Dinas, uh, Zoltan Dinas. He has many things on the uh, on YouTube. I, I really recommend it. It's um, uh, his presentations are very well done. Partly because he keeps the pace. Uh, at, at a reasonable level. So his, his YouTubes are frequently an hour long, but it's an hour uh, well spent. No, uh, part of the problem is, part of the problem is, is uh, I was trained as a, uh, a physical uh, scientist, uh, I'm an enzyme protein chemist. So uh, part of it is my training. I grew up thinking that, uh, well, the, uh, it's uh, it's a catchphrase to say that if you do a good experiment, you don't need any statistics. And uh, one of the good statistics folks said, uh, that's probably true, but we so rarely do a really good experiment that I'm writing this book. So, uh, but it's, um, so partly uh, the fault is my own. I mean, I just, uh, when I got into, uh, 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 nutrition, I didn't uh, understand the reliance on statistics. It, it's very heavy. Uh, and so I tried to understand it. I tried to understand, um, uh, I, I saw the value of what is, um, well, let me back up and tell you about statistics. The hit, history of statistics the recent history involves what's known as a search for statistical significance. And it has a series of uh, logical uh, steps. But it's based on the idea that you are to exclude what's called the null hypothesis. In other words, suppose I'm trying to test uh, uh, I have this thing on screen. Red, does red meat cause uh, diabetes? Okay. Now the null hypothesis is no, that red meat does not cause diabetes. So what what they say you should do is uh, uh, what's called excluding the null hypothesis. In other words, you you show that 
and, and this is a, a statement of the procedure that the, the results that you found could not have arisen by just at random. And so what you do there is you have a mechanism, you specify how many studies you would need to show that. You get the computer to do a random study, and then you set a value, typically 5%. And you say that if it uh, uh, comes under that, then you've excluded the uh, null hypothesis, okay? So that makes sense. That's what you want to do. You want to get rid of it. The question, uh, well, I'll ask you. I'll ask, uh, but I'll ask everybody he here. Suppose, because it, it, in so far as I've stated it, it's not too far out. You want to get rid of the idea that the null hypothesis uh, is true. Suppose, however, that you can't exclude the null hypothesis. Suppose you run this stuff through the computer and uh, it says, no, you can't exclude the null. This could have arisen by uh, at random. What does that mean? I'm, I'm putting everybody on the spot because what Dinas, the, uh, the uh, statistician I, I, was, uh, I mentioned, what he said is that he went through the literature and there were, uh, I don't remember the numbers, something like 80% of the people on the, um, uh, in the literature said that if you can't exclude the null hypothesis, that means the null hypothesis is true. That's wrong. That's not what it means. It means you don't know anything. It may be true, but your test may not have found it. It may be false, but uh, uh, you couldn't exclude it. And uh, likewise, you don't know whether the, your main hypothesis is true. It could be red meat causes diabetes. It would be a stretch by what we know normally. Uh, I didn't really understand that. I mean, literally, uh, uh, and the reason I can admit that is if 80% of the people that are publishing stuff and presumably have better experience with such, if they didn't get it right, they'd give me a break. <laughs> so uh, I mean, I'm just a chemist. So uh, what does that mean though, in terms of uh, practical ethics? It means that you're under pressure to get a result. And that's very dangerous in science. And what that means is that if you, uh, and this is, this is the bombshell that I uh, 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 learned last week. I, I don't want to go over anybody's head here, uh, but it's worth, uh, uh, like I say, it took me uh, my whole life to learn it. Uh, if you're just under statistical significance, there's a, a pressure for you to do things like, uh, uh, adding in uh, confounders or uh, to become statistically significant. That's compromising uh, the kind of science you're doing. And that's why the uh, uh, literature is full of uh, junk like uh, nutritional uh, epidemiology. I mean, there is the overwhelming thing which uh, everybody uh, knew, though, that if it's just Statistically significant, that doesn't tell you that it's biologically significant. You know, statistically significant is just a mathematical manipulation. You have to know the subject to, uh, uh, to decide. Uh, the, if red meat consumption and uh, the risk of type 2 diabetes have a statistically significant association, that doesn't mean anything. You got to show that, that, uh, that the, that there's some real data there, uh, and you and you got to give an explanation. Where where does red meat tie into uh, 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 diabetes? Uh, on the face of it, uh, you don't have to be in uh, biology for more than uh, a couple of weeks to realize that uh, that kind of association would never be found. So, what has happened? And this this is. Uh, uh, this is a really uh, current study in uh, a scientific understanding and scientific philosophy. 
there is the, the phenomenon, uh, the, the method called Bayes statistics. Now, uh, and I'll explain it to you. When I explain it to you, you'll, you'll understand why I couldn't understand the old statistics and why, I, why this kind of statistics is what we should have been doing. Here's what Bayes said. Bayes said, if you have a hypothesis uh, and you want to test it, you uh, start out with the hypothesis in your mind. That's your belief, okay? Now you do an experiment and then you uh, multiply the probability of the, uh, say you're looking at an association, the probability of the association uh, times your original belief and uh, you correct for the availability of the two things you're, you're associating with. Okay, it sounds complicated, but all I'm saying is that uh, you go in with a belief, you do the experiment and the experiment modifies your belief. Well, who would have thought otherwise? Not that that, you know, was an explanation down to the detail, but that's a good definition of science. That's what I was thought. That's what I, I thought when I was eight years old. When I was eight years old, I uh, uh, I guess at public school or high school, they, they used to tell us about the scientific method. You know, you make a hypothesis and this and that. And I, at that age, I knew that it didn't make any sense. Uh, you know, I, I don't remember what they said because I knew that what you do in science is you apply common sense. You have a belief. You look at. You ask yourself: Does the experiment support your belief, or does it uh, make it seem worse? Uh, well, of course, it wasn't long after being age eight that uh, I found out there's more to science than what I understood at that age. Uh, but that is the basic idea. So, uh, if you go with uh, traditional statistics. And you, uh, that is, it, uh, it, it doesn't have a name uh, exactly. It's, uh, it, it is the search for scientific, uh, for statistical significance. That's what it does. Sometimes it's called um, uh, frequentist statistics because it starts by asking what is the frequency of occurrence of uh, various events. You go with that, you're in trouble. You know, it has so many uh, possible errors that you can get in trouble. Whereas I think if you, uh, I don't know if I explained it well enough, but if you think about base statistics, it's just what, what common sense tells you. And, and uh, along those lines, Bayes uh, was uh, in the 18th century. He was an 18th century uh, uh, cleric and uh, uh, preacher. Uh, and he, he didn't describe it, the theory exactly that way. It took Laplace to frame it into our uh, current understanding, but it, it's an idea that was there. And that is what most people did as statistics. They didn't, they didn't call it Bayesian, they didn't call it anything, they just did it. And then the, um, uh, obviously, I'm not an expert on the history of statistics, but the major, there are several uh, statisticians that are associated with in instituting this uh, idea. And uh, the main one is uh, uh, Fisher. And I, uh, as I say, I'm not an expert in this field, but I made the joke that I thought that uh, Harold Fisher was the Ansel Keys of statistics. Uh, and uh, when I, I dropped that to statisticians, uh, uh, they all laughed and said, yeah, that's right. He instituted an, an idea that corrupted things for the next 50 years. Uh, so that uh, was an eye opener for me. So the answer to the question is uh, uh, what kept me or kept us back from understanding is I just didn't get it. And uh, the, um, uh, my excuse is uh, lots of people didn't get it. And because it has a, a really important underlying philosophy, what Fisher was trying to do was say that there is a scientific uh, absolute uh, frequency. 
and that if you use the statistical method, uh, you can determine that. Okay. In other words, he, he said there's a reality out there and that we scientists have to find that reality. What Bayes was saying is that uh, the best we can do as humans is try to see what's going on in the reality and come up with a probability, a belief. Well, that's what we do in science. And uh, so Fisher was way off, uh, off the mark. Uh, I, I don't know if this is uh, what you bargained for, but uh, uh, that is really a current problem. And, and it shows up, uh, the, uh, the ethics of the situation in my view is that uh, uh, nutritional epidemiology is a threat to the patient. You know, uh, this thing I have on the screen uh, red meat consumption and risk of type 2 diabetes. If you believe that, uh, that, uh, that has a serious effect on the patient. Uh, so um, <laughs> I, I hope I didn't uh, uh, destroy anybody's uh, breakfast with uh, uh, philosophy, but uh, that's where we're going. Well, I mean, to, just to follow up on this. So, you know, we continue to see this, this data torturing of the women's health study and the nurses health study and all these, you know, they, they continue to reanalyze these, these large cohort studies over and over again to produce this epidemiologic. How do we actually answer this question? If I wanted to say, does red meat cause, can, uh, cause diabetes or cancer? I guess diabetes is probably an easier one to do. How would we design a study to actually and accurately or at least reasonably accurately answer that question rather than relying on this stuff, which is uh, full of, uh, I think, questions and confounders and uncertainty. Well, we try to be honest and do an experiment. Well, you know, part, part of it is that I, I always like the French word for experiment, uh, experience. Your experience tells you a lot. And w when they, the statistics goes against your experience, it's got to be pretty good. Uh, well, let me uh, look at this slide here. The results suggest that red meat consumption, particularly the old processed red meat, is associated with an increased risk of uh, type 2 diabetes. So, uh, deviation from common sense and intuition requires strong proof. So, statistics should be simple. Best statistical test is the eyeball test. So that's what the data shows. The blue uh, indication is the per capita red meat consumption. And between 1980 and 2010, it went dramatically down. It went down in uh, pounds uh, per person. That's a big drop. This, this is not uh, uh, trivial stuff. The red line is the incidence of type 2 diabetes in millions of people. So this, this is also not small. Uh, so the answer to your question is, you look at the data. Now, uh, this is uh, the consumption of, med meat, uh, of red meat is subject to big error. We all know that. Uh, we, uh, uh, well, our group tries to tell you they're eating more meat than they're eating. Some people try to tell you they're eating less meat. But, uh, but when you're talking about, uh, you know, difference of 20 pounds per, per person, uh, that's real data. So this, this, is, uh, this tells you that that paper was wrong, plain wrong. And I wrote to Walter Willett, who was one of the authors. Walter and I, um, uh, we try to maintain some kind of uh, collegial relationship uh, where obviously uh, 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 we're obviously not on the same wavelength, but we try to get, I wrote to him and he, his answer was that there are other complications. Well, where are those other complications? You got to explain that. Um, here's his data. Now, people ask me, what does a scientist do? What, what's the first thing a scientist does when confronted with a scientific paper? And uh, uh, 
quite honestly, the first thing we do is we look for the pictures. Uh, of course, they're called figures, but people write whole books on why figures are better than uh, tables. And uh, I think it's obvious why. Uh, it's a snow drop. You know, you, you're, not, you're not going out there and telling people uh, what it's all about. Well, here's one thing you could do. Now, what, what they do in these studies is they, ha they have all the uh, uh, data on uh, different people and they break them up into equal uh, uh, collections. So uh, quintiles means uh, uh, take the total population that they're studying. Uh, I don't remember, this may have been one of the uh, uh, things that uh, uh, the Harvard School of Public Health is working and reworking, like you say, they're torturing the data. Uh, so they ha uh, each of these is an equal number of people. Then they look at how many of people in each group have diabetes. Now, the, the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, they, they look first at how many um, uh, the equal numbers, but they're arranged in quarter uh, to uh, red meat consumption. So uh, group five got the most red meat and group one had the least red meat. And then uh, you ask, what is the uh, percent of those people that had diabetes? Well, clearly number five, the red meat eaters had more diabetes than uh, uh, group one. The question though is how much more? So suppose, uh, suppose I just took the, all the people and instead of asking how much red meat they were eating, just threw them into, uh, you know, statistics is always throwing uh, tennis balls into tin cans. Suppose I just did that, made e equal amounts of people in, in uh, each, uh, I'm sorry, uh, e a uh, random collection of meat eaters across this. What would it look like? Well, it wouldn't look too different from what you get. And given the error in how much red meat you're talking about, how much would you change your, uh, your diet of it? Uh, and let me, let me digress because this is a very important question. Uh, when people report that uh, there's uh, one and a half time the, the uh, hazard ratio that, uh, with a relative risk, uh, which means just, just what you think. It means uh, uh, if you have a risk of diabetes of uh, 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 so much compared to some other group, they are not saying to you that this is your risk of getting diabetes compared to being healthy. They're, saying what is the risk of getting diabetes compared to some control group. Uh, in other words, the, the classic example of interpreting epidemiology, real epidemiology, I mean, it, uh, it, it, it is a serious field, it, of course, is Bradford Hill's study of uh, cigarette smoking and lung cancer. And he found that uh, uh, it, it's a, uh, he found that the, the percentage, the probability of, of getting lung cancer as a smoker compared to a non-smoker is 20 to one. So the real answer to uh, how to fix epidemiology is get big numbers. If you have a, uh, but, but the thing that is not always discussed in, uh, uh, in, in these analyses is there are people in Bradford Hill study who didn't smoke and they got cancer. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means they weren't susceptible or they uh, had other uh, genetic factors or whatever. What it doesn't mean is it doesn't mean that not smoking gave them cancer. In other words, cancer, we understand that smoking can give you cancer and that had to be proved, but there's no reason to believe that not smoking causes cancer. Well, that's not the case here. There is no reason to believe that not eating red meat is good for you. Maybe not eating meat is better uh, because you'll eat uh, less carbohydrates or whatever. 
Okay, so uh, the important point here is you're comparing two groups. It's not, you don't get your, uh, this is a real, uh, we have equal uh, uh, belief going into this. Uh, basically, you're betting when you do this on, if you actually uh, start reducing red meat, you're betting that that's going to help you. But you don't know, it may hurt you because we don't have enough background to know that. You don't get your chips back. You, you put your money on a, a number. Uh, if you don't win, you lose. So that's that's very important to understand in all these epidemiology studies. Uh, so what is the difference? Well, it's not much. It's well, you can see what it is. It's in the ballpark of two percent. In addition, they went all out and compared this big one to the smallest one, uh, but. What, what is the uh, advantage in these guys eat a little bit of red meat? What, what, how much uh, is it going to cost you if you uh, uh, increase your red meat? Well, not much. And, and this is against a, uh, you know, you, uh, you still have a 5% uh, uh, chance of getting diabetes down here. Now, uh, that can go up uh, to eight and a half percent, but that's a different uh, ballgame. So uh, that makes sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, when you're dealing with these small relative risk differences, you know, absolute risk, it, it, you know, it becomes how important is it to actually make those adjustments. But, and again, you mentioned that, you know, we, there's so much uh, potential for uh, data collection error, recall bias, particularly in these things, or food frequency surveys, and you're, you're dealing with an order of a few percent, that's probably within the error range of data collection, in my, in my, in my guess, but, you know, it's hard to say, and then, of course, you've, you've got all the other confounding factors of the healthy user bias, which has been well described. Let me ask you, I mean, because I want to touch a little bit about cancer, because you said you've been focusing on novel ways to detect cancer, uh, and I'm not sure, you know, I mean, obviously, there's there's biomarkers, blood tests, there's imaging, there's physical exam. What do you mean by that? And then what, ha what have been the results with dietary interventions with cancer in your, in your experience? Uh, okay, let, let me finish this thing off because uh, okay. uh, they did do what you said. Uh, this is all their data and they adjusted for age. So obviously older people are more, more susceptible to uh, uh, all kinds of disease. Well, alcohol enters into it, uh, and they considered cigarettes as modifying. Now, the important point is that when you say that the risk from red meat is modified by whether you're a smoker, that's biasing the answer, because why not look at the data as saying your risk of getting uh, a diabetes from cigarettes is modified by your red meat? You know, it's, it's your choice which you want to think is the primary effect. And so this is sort of a cop out right there. And then it's smoking. Family history of diabetes. This is heavy data massaging. History of hypertension, total calories, dietary score, and shirt size, not shirt size. Mathematically, there's no distinction between confounding and explanatory variable. What he means by that is it's, it's just as important to ask about the effect of red meat on smoking as the effect of smoking on red meat. So uh, I this makes me think of the old joke. Uh, well, that's uh, uh, not meaningful relative risk. So the uh, well, the woman calls the police because the guy across the street is exposing himself. So the uh, police show up and the cop says, lady, I, that window is too high. I can't see anything. And she says, sure, where you're standing, but get up on this chair, you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, if you have to do that much work to prove your point, something's wrong. Uh, okay, that's, uh, uh, I was good. we'll leave this for, uh, uh, different time. Uh, well, let me tell you about what we're doing. It's not really, uh, well,
Well, uh, well, let me back up and ask if, the, if this, I'll give you the, uh, a very brief statement of the, uh, what we're trying to do with ketogenic diets. And uh, then I'll tell you the, the, uh, our, our study on uh, novel methods of detection. Uh, so basically, we're trying to follow up the idea that whatever the uh, effect of a ketogenic diet will be uh, by itself, uh, taking a uh, maybe parallel point of view, we're also asking, does the ketogenic diet affect, because it changes your whole metabolism. I mean, that's the uh, rationale. Uh, what is the effect on other uh, modalities? Uh, in other words, we have a lot of cancer drugs and uh, I'm not a clinician and uh, I don't know how big a generalization to make beyond the fact that it seems to be terrible. They have terrible effects on quality of life, uh, uh, terrible side effects. And, uh, you know, in some sense you could say it's because cancer is normal. Cancer is too normal. It overgrows. You know, part of life is, is growing, and it uh, uh, you can't stop it from growing. So uh, you're really trying to stop a normal process, and it's not surprising you're going to hit other normal uh, behaviors. Uh, so uh, uh, several people, uh, uh, Dom D'Agostino has uh, done. Uh, uh, very good work on showing the uh, synergy of a ketogenic diet or, or um, uh, specifically uh, uh, agents that generate ketone bodies uh, for other uh, modalities. And uh, our lab did a similar thing with uh, a mouse uh, study. Uh, this, this is a mouse that spontaneously generates uh, breast cancer. And uh, if you treat it with rapamycin, which is a um, uh, an inhibitor of uh, you know the internal control systems in the uh, cell, uh, it reduces the tumor and it extends the longevity of the mouse. If, you, if at the same time, or I, I mean, alternatively, if you put the mouse on a ketogenic diet, uh, you also get a shrinkage in the tumor and extend the life span of the uh, uh, of the mouse. The combination of those two is synergistic. So they live much longer and the tumors do shrink. So that's the kind of study that uh, we're interested in. Uh, related to it is, uh, and, and I'm going to describe our no uh, the novel message. This was uh, developed by my colleague, uh, Matthew Pincus. And uh, uh, to do this, it's, um, uh, I have to give you some background and uh, I have to get, uh, uh, bring to you some of the pain in doing this kind of research. There are a lot of acronyms, okay, there are a lot of abbreviations. So, uh, and it's because we have, <laughs> I think it's because we have so many things that uh, don't work out we're afraid to give it a real name because uh, tomorrow they're going to be uh, gone and we'll use up all the names. Uh, so uh, there are two kinds of uh, internal built-in controls of cancer. There are what are called oncogenes, things that tend to cause cancer. And uh, there are what are called tumor suppressors, which do uh, basically what it says, they suppress the tumor. Uh, the most common of these is called P53. Okay, I think there are three uh, terrible abbreviations uh, to keep straight, but P53 is the major tumor suppressor. It's a, uh, the P53 gene is associated with maybe 50% of, of all cancers. Uh, it's a, it's a, the P53 gene product is a protein, uh, a fairly large uh, protein, okay. Uh, now, 
the mechanism by which P53 works is it interrupts what's called the cell cycle. So cells pass through uh, a, a resting stage, a growth stage, and then uh, they divide. And uh, they go through this uh, series of division and growth uh, and uh, without getting into the details, that's called the cell cycle. Uh, P53 uh, interferes with the cell cycle and it has the uh, effect of uh, allowing uh, um, Well, P53 suppresses tumors uh, by uh, returning the cell cycle to a kind of normal state. The uh, an abnormal P53 protein uh, will disrupt the cell cycle. Uh, you'll overproliferate. So Matthew uh, Matthew Pincus's idea. His idea was if P53 interrupts uh, uh, the cancer process, what is it doing? Uh, and can we target what it's doing? Well, abbreviation number two is HDM2. Uh, uh, I think there's only two out of three of these. So P53 attaches to HDM2. HDM2 is a, cell, is a nu nuclear uh, protein. It's in the uh, uh, membrane of the nucleus. Um, and it attaches. And then the combination of HDM2 and P53 gets trashed. And then it goes back to another uh, uh, cell cycle, hopefully in a more normal way. So the idea is, can we make something that imitates P53 and uh, keep it from getting trashed and by taking out HDM2? So uh, again, P53 is targeting HDM2, uh, that gets trashed. We wanna keep uh, the chemistry of P53 in there. So Matthew's idea, well, you know, uh, a protein is a polypeptide. It's a, a long string of amino acids. And uh, uh, Matthew uh, identified, uh, I think it's about 30 amino acids, which is, which is what HDM2 is looking for. So his idea was if he could put in this, uh, make a fragment of the P53, if he could make this little piece and put it into a cell, then it would target HDM2, it would take HDM2 out of the uh, equation, and P53 would now be free to uh, uh, keep the uh, cell cycle under control. Uh, so the only other, uh, well, he had, uh, he made the uh, peptide and had it uh, uh, sent it to a lab for analysis. And uh, because they do a lot, they, they put on their serial name or something, and they called it PNC27. Uh, but the name stuck because uh, Matthew Pincus would never name a protein after himself, uh, but that's where the name came from. Okay, so the question is, here's the idea. PNC27 imitates uh, P53, is gonna take out HDM2, leaving P53 free to uh, uh, have a longer lifetime to fix the tumor. So it's a great it's a great story of uh, serendipity. He uh, put the PNC twenty seven in. It killed the cell, killed the cancer cell. Did not kill the normal cells. So he tried a whole bunch of different uh, cancers. It killed all of them, including those that did not express the p fifty three protein. Huh? So. He found something, but it was not what he thought. So how did this happen? What's going on here? What he found is that for some reason, we don't know why, we're still trying to find out if it's really true. We, we, it's not absolutely established. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's research and 
were very optimistic, but uh, uh, the famous chemist Albert St. Georgi uh, used to say, uh, uh, today, today we celebrate, tomorrow we do the controls. Uh, you never know when something's going to go wrong. So, uh, but here's what, what he found, is that for some reason, the cancer cell was transporting this HDM2. Remember, that's the P53 target. The HDM2 was getting transported to the cell membrane. So it looked like the difference between a cancer cell and a normal cell is that normal cells have HDM2 only in the nucleus. Cancer cells have it on the surface. So PNC27 came in. It was going to go after the HDM2, but it never got into the cell because it encountered HDM2 on the cell surface. And the combination made a hole in the cell and killed the cell. Uh, and... Uh, we don't know why it is that cancer cells transport HDM2 from the nucleus. But uh, what we do know is that uh, normal cells don't do that. So he has a whole, I think he has probably 40 different cell lines and two different mouse models that uh, PNC27 is, is killing and it's not hurting the uh, normal cells. So uh, uh, he explored this uh, 10 years ago. So we had we have very good cell data and very good mouse data. The, uh, the, the next stage, which is a human clinical study, is, uh, has a huge financial barrier. The, the uh, uh, amount that it would take to do this with humans is, is tremendous. Uh, but we are uh, exploring that. Uh, uh, we we uh, we were very fortunate in having an angel in our original uh, uh, work uh, on the uh, with the ketogenic diet. We, we did have a uh, an anonymous donor who was called. Uh, we have to call him the donor, uh, but uh, we hope to. Uh, find another one or talk to him about uh, starting another uh, level of uh, stuff. So it, it's very promising. We've been repeating the old work and it's looking pretty good. The, the kinds of things you can see are, are actually uh, quite interesting. You, you can put in a dye that goes after the nucleus. It's a blue dye. And under the microscope, you can see all these blue cells. And uh, then we put in a red dye that it's attached to an antibody uh, to HDM2. And uh, so if you look at that under the microscope, you see lots of red dots. And uh, if you, uh, the microscope is, it, it's what's called a confocal microscope. It's kind of a microscope of a microscope. It gives very, uh, uh, a fine detail. If you look at the two together, you see a blue ball covered with red dots. So it's uh, uh, it's where we want to go. The next stage is to uh, uh, the next stage is, is to uh, look at some human tissues uh, and. Uh, uh, well, I'll report as soon as we know the answer on that. So that, that's where we're going on that. Dr. Mercy, unfortunately, we're, we're closing in on the time we have allotted for this. Um, I wanted just, if you could just, you mentioned ketogenic diets having a role. Does this, does this tie into that? Or how do you see this playing out? Like, you know, if everything works out like you think it does, and there's no guarantee that will, obviously science is subject to finding out what works and what doesn't. But um, if, if your hypothesis is correct, how does that impact this in a practical real world application sense? Oh, well, uh, if, if you can, uh, well, uh, we have uh, one set of preliminary experiments. So this is like, that's all I can tell you right now. And that is that we need way less PNC27 uh, to kill cells if we uh, also put in uh, acetoacetate, the, the, one of the ketone bodies. 
So, uh, and they are uh, synergistic, as I recall. There's a complication there, uh, which is that uh, the commercially available acetoacetate is lithium acetoacetate. And, um, and people use that. Uh, and I was always suspicious of it, but you can't uh, track down everything. It turns out lithium itself uh, is a, uh, uh, will kill cancers. Uh, so lithium acetoacetate actually has two, uh, two agents. Uh, and well, the reason we did it is some people found that the lithium has no effect. You know, can't, the big problem obviously in cancers is everybody says, there's no such thing as cancers. There's a bunch of different cancers. So there are cancers that don't respond to lithium. But the one uh, we had, um, I can't remember what we were looking at in that, because we're going to redo it with uh, regular acetoacetate. But the, the goal is, it is exactly what we had with our mouse rapamycin model and what uh, Dom D'Agostino and, and several people have. We, we're going to see if we can get the uh, uh, cancer drugs to be tolerable because we can, if they're synergistic with the ketogenic diet, uh, we can, you can put people on a ketogenic diet before they uh, uh, get the pharmacology and uh, you can use way lower doses. So uh, uh, e even with rapamycin, uh, uh, well, rap rapamycin is not a cancer drug because it uh, uh, corrupts the immune system. And I think it's actually used uh, as a drug for uh, immunosuppression, uh, you know, in transplants. Uh, but it's pretty toxic. And uh, if you could use it as a cancer drug without compromising the immune system, that would be... Uh, uh, that would be a real step forward, especially because it's such a well-studied drug. And uh, uh, so we, yeah, we, uh, you know, it's a, I don't know how much you can generalize from these cell studies, but it, it uh, we would be reducing the IC50 by uh, uh, 70%, you know, so uh, of course it's a long way to uh, uh, treatment. Interesting, uh, Dr. Fine, this has been really enjoyable and I apologize, you know, we, we usually keep this in an hour and I know you've got so much material, you could probably talk for several hours and maybe we'll have to do a part two and even part three down there if you're, if you're game for that. Um, you know, I think the, you know, the, the first part about how we have a real, a real crisis in science, I think that's valid and I think it's, 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 it's hurting people. I think it really is. And, I, and I'm glad you're pointing that out and hopefully uh, we can get some more people to understand that. And, you know, obviously the funding matters and, uh, all those types of things. So thank you again for, for being on here and doing what you're doing. Um, where can people go to find out more of this information that you're sharing? Do you have a website? Do you have anything? Where people well, can I, we have a website. We have a, uh, I have a, uh, a blog, which hasn't been used for a while. I, I'm uh, trying to, uh, I'm going to set up a newsletter and uh, I, I'm, uh, I feel free to bug me about that. <laughs> I've been procrastinating for a while, uh, uh, but I, I actually would like to set a newsletter. To do a good newsletter, of course, I think you have to ha have it very frequent. So I, I will also, uh, we're also planning to have uh, Matthew Pickus do cancer stuff. And we have um, uh, uh, um, Uh, uh, Mary Baker Barnes is going to uh, do some recipes too, so we'll try to get it regular. So, uh, but by saying this out loud, I'm now forcing myself to make good on it. Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you did, you, you did me a real favor, and uh, I may forgive you, but uh, so. Uh, well, thank Okay. Uh, well, but actually, you know, the, the final thing that I wanted to say is the flip side of how uh, screwy this, the uh, uh, functional science is. You guys, uh, the, the people have done it. I mean, you've uh, done it and uh, uh, so many groups have uh, uh, 
brought this uh, ketogenic diet, uh, uh, carnivorous diet, all, all of these things into uh, uh, reality. And so I, uh, you know, I'm sort of a curmudgeon, so I always give people a hard time about uh, uh, this or that or imprecision of, uh, so, but I, I'm truly impressed with how uh, uh, people have done it for themselves. I, it's just uh, so, um, uh, you know, let me give you a lot of credit for what you're doing and, and uh, uh, the whole gang out there. Uh, so uh, I didn't want to forget that. Well, I, and I certainly appreciate that, and you're you're absolutely right. It's it's not me, but it is the whole gang, and it's. I think Tim Noakes is funny using the, the the phrase "wisdom of the crowd," which I'm sure he didn't invent, but he kind of led me to that. And I think we're seeing that, and we're not done. We got a lot a lot of work to do, and we're going to do some clinical trials, and hopefully do good science, and uh, continue to push this because I think it's I think it's a service to do so. Anyway, Dr. Feynman, it's been an absolute pleasure. I, I mean, it. If, if you'd like, if you'd be willing to come back, we'd love to have you on to talk more and, and maybe maybe even spend spend a little more time so you can. I, I know because there's a lot of background. It's hard just to just to sort of yeah. uh, not provide background to to get the points across. But we'd love. Yeah. To have well, you know, at uh, early on uh, uh, discussing stuff, I uh, once said at a conference that we because we were talking about. Uh, uh, you know, the theory of calories in, and I said that uh, uh, Dr. Fine and I were found ourselves doing philosophy, which we had made fun of in college. Uh, but that's really it. And, uh, but it's real here. So, uh, and uh, I hope I didn't uh, bear everybody down with too much uh, philosophy there. Uh, no, I think I think I enjoyed it, and I, I assume most of the folks did too. Thank you again. I do have to run though. I've got another meeting. Uh, appreciate right, it. And Take care, and hope you, uh, you can always communicate with me. You know, uh, I have lots. There's lots of angles through email, and uh, I answer people if I can, or at least at the rate I can. Okay. okay. Thanks okay. a lot. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you back tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Take care now. Bye bye. Thanks, Dr. Feynman.